I'm Pascal Crow. I'm the Data and Democracy Project Officer at Open Rights Group. Um, and one uh, project we've done recently was um, in conjunction with Demos, um, Britain's leading cross-party think tank. Uh, we've been working with Harry Carr, who is the Director of Innovation uh, at Demos. Um, and uh, yeah, we've been working on this exciting project using Polis, which is a kind of uh, digital democratic innovation um, that we think provides a kind of positive use case for um, um, dem democracy and uh, technology and kind of how they can, can kind of interact in a kind of positive way rather than the kind of negative way that we hear about in the news. So yes, I'll crack on. So what we did, we wanted to do two things with, with this project. Um, one of them was the end in itself, which the uh, topic of the uh, project itself, uh, which was around political uh, data-driven campaigning and public attitudes around that. Um, but it was also in itself um, aimed at understanding how polis works and giving a, an, a view of what it looks like for a participant and also as a a researcher. Uh, this is also the first time uh, that it's been used with a nationally representative sample. Uh, so uh, the sample was provided by Dynator, who also provides the sample for our polls and, and lots of other pollsters' polls. Um, and we can go through a, a bit of detail about what the what that process looks like as as well. So there's kind of two two different things that we're going through. So I'll start off with the stuff about how polis works and looks. Uh, and then go on to talk about the specific subject that we looked into. That can also be used to understand why polis is a useful, useful innovation. And I'm happy to take questions on, on either of those two kind of strands of the project. Uh, so first off, this is what it looks like. If you have uh, been put through to polis, something like this is what you're going to see on the right hand side of the page. So we go through uh, and say, this is what we're actually talking about. In this case, it's data-driven political campaigning. Uh, we provide specifically provo more provocative statements than we perhaps would do normally in a in a normal poll. Um, people can agree or disagree with the statements, as you can see uh, here, uh, and you can also click pass if you're not sure about your answer. Um, and then once people have done that, they can also share their own perspective at the bottom here uh, and put in any views that they think haven't been covered in the statements that have already been put in. There's also at the bottom of it an automated cluster analysis. Now that's really useful for us as researchers to be able to understand where, how uh, public opinion divides, how different strands of opinion hang together, uh, but we thought it's also interesting for participants to be able to, to look at that. In principle you could also, for example, put in celebrities or particular politicians or the rep nationally representative uh, uh, view of people in one in one particular section, the average person or the average man or the average person in social grade C1 or whatever it is. Um, so you could locate yourself in, in relation to the, the, in this case, this is someone who hasn't clicked on anything yet, so they are bang in the middle. That's what that blue circle is in the middle there. And as you can see, for this uh, particular project, three uh, main groups emerged. There are some outliers, as you can see, uh, around the outside, which are those those little head-shaped things. Uh, they can also see, as a participant, uh, the most uh, unifying and divisive comments are all put on there, uh, and they're at the bottom of their screen. So if they click on majority opinion, you can see the most unifying uh, thing that has been put into the into the project. In this case, it's political campaign should have to obey the same rules when they're advertising online as they do when they advertise in leaflets or on TV which 88% 80, 80 of people agreed. Um, at the other end of the spectrum, uh, the, the most divisive uh, statement was politicians should be free to say what they like. The media will always out liars. There is no need for further regulation. And 57% of people actually disagreed with that statement. It also allows you to see what defines the clusters. Again, useful as a researcher, but also quite interesting as a participant. This is probably probably more interesting when you're making it a a more open. Um, con uh, my brain has gone completely blank. Uh, consultant um, uh, consultation uh, where people are more interested in being able to see how they are and are more engaged with the subject matter rather than. Uh, 
nationally representative poll where you're by its nature getting people who are less engaged with the, the subject matter, but it is interesting nonetheless. So you can see, for example, that uh, A, uh, Group A there, if you click on Group A, it tells you what is the most de um, defining thing about them. Uh, and you can see there are some different options, but Statement 11 is one of them. And actually very few of them think that there should be less regulation around data-driven campaigns to make campaigning more efficient. On the other hand, you'll see that Group C are much more anti-regulation and 74% of them think that authorities shouldn't control what politicians are allowed to say. Uh, before I get further into it, uh, there are some caveats around what we're able to, to say about this or things to bear in mind when we're talking about the, the results. Um, the first is that unlike with the poll, the demographics, they, they will naturally fall out to make each statement similar to the overall sample, but not every participant responded to every statement. Uh, so there will be people who were the first people to take part in the survey. Uh, and they won't see the, the statements which are submitted by people who take part later in the research project. We didn't, and it would basically be a huge amount of time to try to weight each uh, particular statement so that every statement has a, represent a completely perfectly representative sample in it. But we do weight the whole uh, sample as a the sample as a whole, and naturally we'd expect uh fallout to be fairly natural across the thing so we, it, it's going to be broadly representative it's the basic answer uh, is the basic answer some of the statements the ones with the most number of votes are going to be almost exact almost completely nationally representative some of the ones that are later are going to be somewhat less so uh, a key learning for us from this was that uh we ended up with quite a few young people coming in earlier that's basically because uh the, the part our partners are on this who on this donator are much more used to doing polls where it doesn't matter who comes in first as long as you get the right number and as standard young people tend to be recruited earlier for polls on the basis that you end that you then end up it's basically they're harder to get in general and the lo the longer into the project that you that someone is trying to answer it the more niche you end up with the, the targets being so with the the, fla the last few targets it tends to be that you end up with you're short on people from Northern Ireland who are in group E and are 18 to 24 and at that point it makes it even more difficult to get them uh, that's something that we can't do in this for in this and we won't do that going forwards we think, don't think it made a massive amount of impact on this but it's something that that is worth bearing in mind going forwards with it is that making sure that that the whole way through you've got a broadly representative sample rather than starting with one group and then then going moving on to other groups later down the line. The other thing that you'll notice as we go through the results uh, are that people tend to be more likely to agree to any given statement than they would be to disagree with the reverse statement. Uh, so the most divisive statements are much are likely to get uh, a majority disagree, but not by nearly as much as you get the majority agreeing on the most um, on the most uh, consensus building statements. Uh, so the best way to think about this is to to bear both in mind, to so bear in mind statements which are in favour of a position and statements which uh, are against that position and kind of put them against each other rather than just looking at the agree statements in principle. That is also, by the way, something which is worth doing in polling and a, a classic poor use of polling is to put out an agree-disagree statement without any of, any of that kind of background information where actually the best way to get at people's people's opinion is to try to get statements on either side of the on either side of the, the argument. Uh, what this does is allow us to to load those in there. Um, but yeah, again, it's worth bearing in mind all of the statements and all the results together as a whole, rather than picking out individual ones. Uh, there are three clusters as mentioned. Uh, which were really interesting. So um, Group A was pro-regulation. This wasn't, by the way, the majority necessarily of these, but these are just the groups that they're over-indexed in. So there are more middle-class people in, in groups A, B, in social grades A, B, C, one than there are in the in the uh, general public. There are more Remainers, and they make up about 38% of the of the public. Uh, group C are the more, more anti-regulation. They're more likely to be working class, more likely to vote to leave. Similarly, similar proportion of the public. And then there's a group in the middle who don't really care about a lot of the things, are much more likely to pass. Um, they 
the one thing which every group loved was the idea of verifying political statements, statements made by politicians, but they were more split on the wider regulation questions, which Group C were much more opposed to. Uh, and these, uh, that group were much more likely to, to be young. And then there's a, there's a remainder, you'll have noticed that doesn't add up to 100%, the remainder weren't classified into any particular cluster. So what was the story that we found? Uh, the public want line politicians to be held to account. That was the big finding. Uh, and it was the one that elicited the most enthusiasm, um, both in terms of the overall numbers that people put in there in, in terms of their, their statements, uh, but also in, find, in people putting in their own statements. For example, we did not in charity caps say, should be more regulation to stop lies ourselves. That was something that someone else put in. But there were lots more of those kind of comments. Uh, around holding line, line politicians to account than there were about any other subject. Um, again, the, these, these show similar, uh, similar results for, for similar comments. The facts need to be backed by sources or claims should be evidence-based and independently verifiable. Uh, so uh, there is a kind of politicians should line us about it, but there is also a more specific policy thing to most of these statements, which is there should be something which stops politicians from being able to lie with impunity in their political campaign advertisements, which isn't really the case at the moment. Um, people approve of other forms of regulation um, other than verifying uh, claims made in political adverts, but they volunteer fewer ideas about them. So these are all statements which we preloaded into the, into the project rather than things that people came up with themselves. But there was, again, similarly large amounts of support. So for Political companies having to obey the same rules when they're advertising online as they do when they advertise in leaflets or on television. Um, greater transparency of, of, around political funding. Uh, political campaigns having to publish all the advertising materials they use online. Uh, and again, yeah, there should be a fixed budget for campaigning. Really popular. Uh, again, people want service providers to be more and better, do more in themselves and be better regulated as well. Uh, there was, again, you can see some statements which people put in themselves there, data should be get more private. Um, uh, there was a little bit of difference uh, between different ways that they put it. So only 61% said it should be against the law to profile people based on their online data in the first place, which is obviously much more demanding than the others and actually a very radical reform. Um, so that was a really interesting finding that I, actually the majority of people would, would be in favour of that. Uh, views around deregulation are much more malleable. Uh, as you can hear, my, my dogs and wife have arrived back. Uh, I'm going to hand over <laughs> the baby. Oop, you got him. Uh, so if you phrase it as there being less red tape to stopping politicians from saying and doing what they want, if you talk about authorities controlling what politicians are allowed to say, the majority of people are then in favour of deregulation. This is what I meant in terms of people being more likely to agree that to then disagree and that there are some contradictions there. But in a way that it was very consistent when you were talking about statements in favour of regulation, there, there was very it was very inconsistent in terms of deregulation. So when you talk about it doing less regulation because it makes campaigning more efficient or because the media will always outlie us, that, uh, that was uh, the plurality or the majority uh, were opposed to those statements. So broadly, you can safely say that people are very much, the public overall are very much in favour of regulation. Poll, existing polling would also back that up. Um, but there are ways that you could phrase deregulation which would get majority support. And specifically, they are around emotively charged things around red tape uh, and, and shadowy authorities, bureaucrats, who have got an evil enemy who's doing something that will, that will uh, mobilize people against regulation. Um, what I found super interesting, uh, and this is a, a really good evidence as to why Polis is interesting, um, is that the anti-regulation group that we talked about earlier, so this is uh, Group C, uh, actually wants to regulate political campaigning and political coverage, it seems, out of existence entirely, which at first glance looks like a massive contradiction. So these were both statements which we we would never have thought of putting in. Um, but 68% of people who were generally, as you saw, in favour of um, in favour of deregulation and opposed to regulation measures, 
uh, think that political campaigning shouldn't exist at all, that parties should publicize their policies for voters on information portals, no social manipulation. Uh, and that political campaigns are a waste of money and websites or online platforms unrelated to politics should not allow political content. Again, that would be a huge, huge uh, amount more regulation than exists at the moment. So what, what lies behind that contradiction? Basically, they don't think it makes a difference. They just don't trust, they don't think the political campaigns are useful. They don't think they affect their behavior and they also distrust regulators. They, they distrust politicians in the same way as the other groups do, but they also distrust regulators as much. Um, and given the premise that political campaigning is a waste of time and it doesn't actually affect anyone's vote, actually it can make sense to both think that messing with the nuances of how political campaigning is regulated is a waste of time and also that actually it would be a good thing to to have no political campaigning at all uh, and you can see there in group c three quarters um to, to seven and ten think that with target that's based uh, a range agree with a range of statements which basically say uh, that political campaigns don't make any kind of uh, difference to their voting intention so regarding that the actual content, the research content itself, uh, the key findings were that the vast majority of Britons consistently support statements in favour of more regulation, but a majority can also be convinced against it, depending on the framing, although it's much less consistent. All, all of the statements which were in favour of regulation got a, a majority support. That was definitely not the case for deregulation. Uh, opponents of regulation do so from a point of view of nihilism and apathy rather than principles of freedom of speech or faith in democracy. They think politicians are massively untrustworthy. They would actually be happy to see the end of political campaigning entirely. They are definitely not in favour of freedom of speech. They definitely do not have faith in democracy as it stands. Uh, rather, they think that political campaigning doesn't make a difference. They'd rather not, it has no effect in my life. Um, but messing around with the nuances is just uh, bureaucrats waving around red tape and spending money rather than actually uh, making a difference in, uh, in terms of the, the proper running of democracy and protecting against abuses. Uh, on both sides support is most forthcoming when it's rallied in opposition to an emotively charged enemy. Uh, so whilst we had a great deal of support for regulation across the board, the most enthusiasm came and the most ideas that people wanted to say themselves came when we were talking about verifying political facts and holding lying politicians to the fire. Uh, so on the other hand, for opponents of re regulation, uh, or uh, the, the, the best way for them to, to win the argument is to talk about red tape building bureaucrats and shadowy authorities seeking to control public life which isn't terribly doesn't make me terribly optimistic for the future of the conversation here um this incentives seem to um to incentivize uh there being continual divisiveness and polarization around this as with many many things key findings regarding why polis is excellent um so it's open source which is a big thing for both ourselves and for the open rights group and uh, I wanted to say thanks to Colin McGill, uh, who uh, developed Polis in the first place and made it open source uh, and, and helped us with this project specifically. Um, measures, uh, it measures public opinion of responses submitted by participants. That in itself is, super, is really interesting and allows you to get insights that we just would not, never otherwise have got. Um, so, for example, we never would have said abolish political campaigning or political campaigning makes no difference to my behaviour as part of a, a normal poll. Um, and because people put that in and then we saw people's responses to it, we were able to much better understand what was the thinking, what was the values and motivations behind people who were opposed to, to greater regulation of data driven campaigning. Um, and you, what you get is qual data as a quant scale as a result of that. If you did a focus group, then that would be interesting, but you wouldn't be able to make nationally or demographically um, representative inferences, whereas you can with, with this tool. It makes understanding how opinions hang together easy. Obviously, you could do a poll and then do a cluster analysis on it, but the fact that it's automated makes a massive amount of difference uh, in, in terms of how, how it likely it is to be used along those lines going forwards. And the use of that, you can see through through this project, the fact that we were able to identify very easily 
here are the anti-regulators and here is how their wider political opinions um, are relevant and matter was really important um, and it required less, far less involvement and far less money than it would if you were to have done a traditional poll and then done tried to do a cluster analysis on, on the back of it. Um, which again and again financially efficient for the depth and range of insights gathered we could we can in the future this took quite a lot of development um but in the future uh we think this can be uh we can charge something which is not massively more than a normal poll would be which for the the kind the range of insight that you go with you'd normally have to do a poll and a cluster analysis and some qual and still and then another poll based on the qual you don't have to do any of that you don't do that all in one tool and that's incredibly exciting uh, and we've got more research using Polis coming up around the future of towns and the food system and life after COVID. So there's going to be much more where that came from. Uh, and it's all very exciting. And that's me. Cool. Brilliant. Thanks so much for that, Harry. That was um, really, really enlightening. Um, and uh, managed the baby very well. <laughs> throughout. Um, yeah, I just, so I think basically what I'll do is I'll just kind of um, open up with a couple of questions uh, and then I'll start referring questions from the little question bar and the go-to webinar um, plugin thing um, and maybe we can kind of open the floor then a bit. So I think kind of just to start um, in terms of like, the actual findings of the research the thing that stands out is this kind of obviously very powerful narrative about holding politicians feet to the fire, politicians are lying um, the way to stop them lying is to regulate them, et cetera, et cetera. And that, that seems to be quite a kind of strong draw and quite a kind of eff effective frame. Why do you think that that is such an effective frame for this topic or just in general? Uh, I think it's it's very human. And, and that was true. We saw, obviously, that the, the, that was true on the other side, that when if you have a figure of an, an emotively charged figure to kind of oppose, um, then that makes your point of view much more relevant to people and they get much more excited about it. That's why conspiracy theories do so well, right? Is that actually if you if you're if you can people can think about politicians and have an idea in their mind about who they are and it's, it's usually whoever leads or is the, the senior advisor to um, whichever party they don't like. Uh, and the same is true of, of of red tape wielding bureaucrats. Everyone can think of the person in their organisation who they don't like, who does that, and, and and thinking about them being in charge of the government upsets them. So it, it's very normal that if you're able to put that kind of monster figure as the the, the thing that that upsets you and as as the thing that you want to to change, that you're going to get much more more uh, support for for whatever it is that you want to do. Yeah, it's interesting. I think, um, I mean, from our, from my perspective at least, you know, whether you, whether you kind of believe in fake news or not, or whether you think it's kind of effective and powerful, it certainly seems to be a kind of really kind of effective kind of frame and like something about the idea obviously really resonates with people, um, which is kind of interesting. Um, I think um, another question I'd have on the results were. Why, why do you, do you have any kind of insight as to why it's kind of fallen into these kind of three particular groups? What are the kind of relevant kind of socioeconomic factors? Is it age? Is it, is it more socioeconomic? I mean, what do you think is kind of driving the way that's passed out? Yeah. Um, well, there's clearly, I mean, clearly there's one group which are pro and one group, which are, one group which is anti, and that's kind of how you'd have expected it to, to kind of fall out. In terms of the demographics, Again, maybe you could have, you would kind of expect, is it, that the leavers were more likely to um, be more sceptical about regulators? That's been something which we've we've seen the rhetoric of of the vote leave campaign, um, uh, and and members of the Conservative Party and obviously UKIP and Brexit Party uh, uh, saying that the Electoral Commission are essentially a political body and very consciously trying to politicise that. Um, and understandably so that they've been very effective in that and that's something which which kind of really comes out of it is that the people who are most likely to be anti-regulation 
other people who think that the local authority uh, local authorities the authorities um and that that regulate the regulatory body <laughs> regulatory bodies um are are basically just as bad as politicians it's not about pushing up it's not about vacant democracy it's a it's a it's about leveling down and making them feel that they are a, a similar part of of the same political sphere that they hold in contempt overall so the, the challenge for people who want to see greater levels of of regulation in this area and in in general uh, the the challenge is making a distinction there between the political parties and the politicians who have always been a fixture of our lives and if they see uh if they don't see the the dangers of political uh, of data driven campaigning of big tech of facebook etc of the surveillance state uh, as anything different from the norm and actually every every generation has had untrustworthy politicians in charge uh, uh, it, you can't sell them on the dangers of that if they if the regulators are just as the same are the same as they've always been uh, and are are just as bad as the rest of them and that the danger of uh, the dangers of data-driven political campaigning aren't any different from data-driven campaigning which has been happening since the 50s the 40s if not before um in in analog rather than digital but but nonetheless cool yeah it's a, yeah lots to think lots to think about that i think, think definitely from our perspective we're always trying to work out how we can get people kind of excited excited about the um about this topic and kind of how to make it more relevant to people's daily lives. Um, cool. I think I'm just going to ask one kind of question about the method, uh, and I'm going to open it up to you guys. Um, cool. So, um, could you maybe just talk a little bit about kind of Polis's use in Taiwan, maybe, and kind of what other policy areas you think it could be used for? And kind of, I think most of all, Polis is obviously trying to kind of creates kind of idea of consensus on policy topics kind of in an era of what seems to be increasing polarization and kind of why what what do you think polis is speaking to in our in our current politics and what what other policy areas would it be good for lots of questions okay so for taiwan um let's start there so that was the, that's the most obvious and, and high profile use of polis which is as part of v taiwan which helped make um decisions primarily around tech related uh policies but and most notably around the regulation of uber in taiwan i've lost you hopefully you're still here um yep. for uh and and basically the the way it works and why it was so useful was that it was able to to find an areas of consensus which brought together disparate groups who who had very different views about what should be allowed in terms of in terms of Uber, and and brought that together, and then were able to do further research, and was directly then put into into practice in terms of policy. In terms of the policies which are relevant uh, and could be used in a similar way to that in 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 the UK, honestly, I think it it shouldn't be just uh, curtained off to to very tech specific policy areas. It obviously can be those sorts of things, um, but I think what I'm excited about with it is that it can be used on all sorts of things and and be used as a as something which does what a lot of things that polling does, um, which could obviously be used for for basically anything. So I think the more important thing, rather than any particular policy area being out of bounds at all, I think almost anything could be. The the important question is is finding a wet, an angle into the into the topic. Which are, which is clear enough for people to understand what it is that they want to be talking about and talking uh, and and what you want out of them, uh, but that can be fairly broad. So some of the things that um, that I was saying about us, our future work, we're we're going to go and do something about the future of towns this week. We're going we're, we're planning to go into into fields, um, and obviously that can be all sorts of things. Uh, it's uh, something which is relevant to know with that is that we've done a load of research beforehand to give us an idea of what the sort of things which would be relevant are an existing with an, uh, a review of existing evidence um but that can range from 
people's closeness to their public services and private amenities um, through to uh, public transport, to potholes, to bin collections, to obviously loads of stuff is likely to come out, um, which is related to, to coronavirus. So I, I really don't think that we should put any limits at all in terms of what policy areas are, are relevant to it. There is a little bit of tweak tweaking and, and you have to get the right angle on that so that it's going to be appropriate um, for uh, people are going to understand what saying if you just say tell me your thoughts about the NHS then you, you're going to you might get something interesting but it's going to be so broad that, that maybe is going to be too disparate to, to really get a really good good analysis of but outside of that as long as you've got something which is fairly specific when you're asking about it and especially if you're asking about it uh, people's views about a particular policy then, then, then the sky's the limit. Any, anything, any, any sort of policy, I think, could be, would be enhanced by having some it go through this process. So people with lived experience of it, uh, and the general, the public at large, will, can come at you with views, with their views in the way that you would get from Qual, but you can get it at a much larger scale. We've got a thousand people looking at it rather than eight people in a focus group or whatever, and you can get national, rep, nationally or demographically rep, representative inferences from it as well um it could be used and i hope it will be used for a very broad range of things cool um brilliant okay thanks harry i'm gonna turn it over to you guys now um so i'm not sure if you can see the questions harry we've got one from jackie smith uh who asks what method of clustering does polis use and what statistical tests so maybe you can speak about that. I mentioned at the very start that there will be questions which I don't know the answer to, and Josh, our more technical man, would be the person to ask, and I'm afraid that's one of them. Sorry. <laughs> we can certainly get back to you though. Hit us up on Twitter, complain, and we'll, we'll I can give you a give you a proper a proper answer about that. Yeah, it's certainly beyond <laughs> my understanding of statistics as well to be able to explain. So um Cool. I mean, I guess one other thing I'd be kind of interested in is you said you've said the sky's the limit, but kind of, I guess, maybe moving a little bit away from actual polis and just this kind of concept of kind of consensus driven politics. And, you know, if we all have a kind of common set of facts, you know, we might agree, et cetera, et cetera. Do you, what do you think the kind of limits of kind of con consensual politics is? Um. So I think that being able to understand and, and identify areas of consensus is, is super interesting and useful and, and is useful for, for every, every set of policies, every policy area. Um, and that's something that, that policy is able to do. It is also not just that. So actually on, on this project, I, I didn't through the, when I was going through the results, spend an awful lot of time talking about what, what drug consensus through through everybody because actually the things that came out most popularly that most people actually agreed with um were generally on one side which was around regulation they those were the with in favor of in favor of regulation and specifically around verif verification of facts uh, now that doesn't doesn't uh, mean that there is 100 percent consensus on those things there was huge amount of consensus by any other metric. So if you poll someone using in a normal poll and got 90% of people supporting it, there are a few things that, that get that amount of support. But there is always going to be that 10% 10, 10 of people who, who disagree with any given any given policy. And what, what polis also allows you to do is understand who they are and what their point of view is. And and also being able to understand what the con what drives those consensus, what drives the consensus and, and defines really and unites. Uh, individual groups. There are there are definitely some areas where it is basically going to be impossible to find a fi find something which is going to completely unite them. The Brexit is the very obvious example where it is really really difficult. You can find some things which which will bring people together, but they tend to be fairly tangential. And where it's been very deliberately um, polarized as a as an argument people are very hostile to hearing anything which is opposed to their pre-existing 
point of view. I don't think that using the using polis, if you tried to, if we tried to come up with a set of a set of statements which uh, built a consensus around Brexit, I'm sure we could find some. It, funding the NHS well, for example, would probably come up and would probably be something which everyone agreed on. But it's not the basis of a future Brexit policy which is going to make everyone happy. So there are always going to be limitations to it. Um, but I think that the, the there is value in finding those, those areas of consensus. And there's also value in understanding uh, the broader context in a way that the that, that policy allows you to do it's not just about defining consensus, although it does do that. Cool, thanks. Yeah, I mean, I always think, I, I personally am always really fascinated by this idea that, I, I guess it, I guess it's a kind of liberal idea that if we all had a kind of common set of facts and we're just kind of having these kind of perfect speech conditions that we'd all, we'd all agree. Um, <laughs> but like, I think, I think, yeah, that I think what you said kind of sounds, that was a, a very thoughtful kind of explanation of that. So we've just got a couple more questions actually from uh, audience members. Um, so um, I'm just going to do them in kind of groups of three. Um, first off, could it be used as part of a citizens assembly process? Asks Jackie. Um, Grant asks, is this useful for citizen political scientists slash small campaign groups? And then Sean says, have there ever been any polls where polis seems to have been broken or not seem reflective of other polls? Um, so I'll go through those in order. In terms of a system, in terms of a citizens assembly, absolutely. Um, what it will allow you to, I, you, there are arguments for it on both sides. I think probably the way that I would think about it is as something which can then feed into a into a citizens assembly to give an understanding of where the the public uh what the public think it uh that could be on a nationally representative scale you could equally if if we want if we were going to have a a proper national citizens assembly which was going to then uh decide something extremely important in the way that for example in ireland uh citizens assemblies were used before the the two uh uh historic referendums which went extremely well um, and do, haven't been marked by massive amounts of divisiveness since the result came in um, then you would be able could for example make it an open consultation um, and with a high enough profile and getting lots of people involved would be would be super interesting in, in and of itself but yeah it, it provides um, information which you wouldn't get from a citizens assembly the biggest citizen assembly isn't going to be as big as the as a normal kind of thousand person nasty representative sample going through going through a polis and you get just sort of different inferences out of that and you can get some ideas about where people stand from it um, and that could feed into feed into the process of citizens assembly in the first place and and, and uh, provide some context for them also could be something which is used to test some outputs from a citizens assembly um, and find out what people think about the recommendations that they make for example in terms of small campaign groups yes that's exactly what we want to do um one of the big things about about polis is making something which it's obviously not not formal deliberation but something which allows some kind of dialogic process allows people to listen to each other and react to each other um uh at a scale which 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 qualitative research and deliberation don't provide to can't, don't and can't provide uh, at a cost which is manageable for not tiny organisations, but you, for, for small organisations in way that in ways that that uh, polling would be. So yes, I, I think it would be really useful for, for for campaign groups to be able to to understand the public's view around whatever they're campaigning about. Uh, say public attitudes to data driven campaigning, for example. Um, uh, in terms, of, oh, has polling shown polis to be broken no so this is as i said i think the first time that it's ever been done so on this one we uh, i know that the open rights group did some polling uh, i don't think we ask any of exactly the same questions but we asked similar questions to to what um around similar topics anyway to to what open rights group did with yougov uh, at the back end of last year and their results were pretty similar to to what we found is my understanding uh, so so far no 
uh, we'll we'll find we'll see. I'm sure there will be times when things will will look different in the way that you do find polling evidence, which sometimes um, uh, doesn't match up from from different organisations. In general, though, I would be very surprised if you found something completely off the wall. I think the the big thing to to note is, and it's a thing that I, I caveated in that presentation, is that being able to just agree or disagree does uh, does hinder the your abil the ability that you'd get in a poll to be able to to really get that get the new ones and be able to compare here's the the best version of the statement in favour of X policy and the best statement against it which one of those two would you prefer or something in the middle you, you can't get that you can just do agree or disagree uh, and what you can do is put those statements put statements that do that up against each other but one of the side effects of the fact that we're allowing people to say what they want which which is really important and a huge boon to to polis as a, a a method does mean that you're not necessarily going to get the other side of every argument included as a as a statement so you might end up with some things where if you phrase it one way and people, people are much more likely to agree with it and actually if you found some other polling which which phrased in a different way you might find different results but if you understand it with that caveat in mind and, and take it on and value of the, uh, as a perception if you phrase this 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 topic in that particular way how people people interact with it and understand it in the broader context of what people think about lots of other different statements which are relevant which polis obviously by its nature allows you to do um, then you're very likely to you're very unlikely to get anything which will completely be at odds with with a poll because this is essentially a poll there's not there's nothing which would make you uh worry that there's going to be any massive difference in terms of methodology cool thanks harry yeah i think that was you kind of got the, the meat of the question there which was um yeah do like the seed statements and follow-up statements kind of influence the results and i think obviously the answer is yeah but that's kind of I think as long as that's transparent, then you know. Yeah, well, that's part of the point of the preload statements as well is that you 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 have to define to an extent what you want people to talk about, um, and then people will, as they did in this case, come up with stuff that you would never have thought of. But you need to have at least a context, and and those preloaded statements provide that, and they give you the opportunity to to provide that balance at the start. Cool. I'm gonna I'm gonna. Give you a final question, which you can kind of sum up in one word or one sentence. It's one from John. Uh, what is in people's minds when they think about political campaigning? <laughs> according according uh, to Polis, depends who they are. So, well, for people who most people, for the majority of people, it appears that it's politicians lying to them. That's the that's the the, the broad sweep. Uh, for but there are a subset of people who think the whole political sphere is evil and I want nothing to do with it. And that's broadly their reaction to anything when you ask them about, about politics. And those are the guys who are anti-regulation. Yeah, I think I'd say the same. I think lies is what people think about, <laughs> think, think about mostly. Cool, well, um, I can't see any more questions in the chat. Um, and I think we've kind of covered everything really. Um, so unless there are any more questions, I'm going to give people a couple of seconds to put something in. Cool. So I can't see any more questions coming up. Um, so I think, yeah, with that, I'm going to call this webinar to a close. Um, Thanks very much, Harry, for coming and talking us through the results and, uh, um, you know, so clearly and eruditely kind of going through what's quite a kind of complex methodology and, and topic. Um, yeah, I put the report into the chat so uh, you guys can go away and read it if you want. Um, and I recommend that you do. Um, and also, like uh, all of our webinars, we've recorded this um, and I'll be putting it on our website uh, fairly soon. Um, and yeah, thank you all for coming, guys. And cheers, That's Harry. Okay, thanks. Thanks for putting up with Arthur. My apologies. <laughs> Cheers, everybody. Cheers, guys.